Can we turn this on? Thank you. Thank you. We have a few people coming in. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Beverly Fishman from the Art Academy. I am very thrilled to have Dan Cameron here. Dan was appointed Chief Curator at Orange County Museum of Art in January 2012. And since then, he's organized exhibitions, um, OC Collects, directed a year-long program, pairings based on their collection, and opened his first major exhibition, the 2013 California Pacific Triennial, in June 2013. Before that, Dan spent five years founding and directing Prospect New Orleans, an international biennial developed to bring art world attention to post-Katrina New Orleans. For most of that period, Cameron also served as director of visual arts for the Contemporary Arts Center New Orleans, where he organized more than a dozen solo and group exhibitions. I became aware of Dan's work when I lived in New York and he was the senior curator at the new museum in downtown Manhattan from 1999 to 2006, which in my mind is one of the mo has continued to have the most provocative, challenging exhibitions, uh, I would say, pretty much in the country. I'm always surprised what's going on there. And Dan was, I think, created spectacular, important, exhibitions, sometimes with artists that were not as valued as they needed to be. Um, and so I, I actually thank you for that. From 2002 to 2011, Cameron organized 10 successive editions of the annual Next Wave Art ex Exhibition at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is called BAM. He has taught graduate uh, classes from Columbia, to the School of Visual Arts, pretty much everywhere. He's the man to, to listen to. I give you Dan Cameron. Wow, <laughs> what an introduction. Thank you, Bev. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be back um, at Cranbrook. The last time I was here, um, there was a whole lot going on. And, and I felt like I never really got a chance to kind of see things and, and, and dialogue uh, well with people. And now I feel like maybe this is a, a whole new start uh, in a way. Uh, Bev challenged me by asking me, you know, we, we started a dialogue that has to do with painting and she wanted me to talk about what I was doing, but also to reference painting. And I'm the kind of a curator, and I think artists are like this too, where if you've developed a body of work and somebody asks you to come and talk about it, the really hard thing is to know when to start and to know when to stop. Well, those two important things. And because there's a whole lot that you could conceivably touch upon, um, but you have to make an order out of it somehow. And if your practice as a curator, as an artist, is primarily investigatory or research-based, uh, it makes it doubly hard because what you're doing is, is saying, you know, there have been a series of questions or investigations that I've undergone and they've brought me to a certain point and then I've started on another one. And then we just keep going into these investigations. Uh, so I, I wanted to construct today's um, talk a little bit just you know, for, for, for this audience, um, kind of trying to mix these two ideas. And in particular, uh, treat one of the things that I have uh, most embraced as a principle as a, being a curator, uh, which is the idea of complete pluralism in the visual arts. I'm someone who does not and will not distinguish between media and I don't believe it makes any sense anymore in the 21st century to distinguish uh, be with style or technique. In other words, any possible <laughs> combination uh, of any of these factors, any way of making art uh, is potentially valid. And I, um, I think this has been a, a point of contention uh, in the art world, uh, even at, and you could even say in particular, uh, during times when painting itself is, is riding very high and is very visible uh, and making a big impression uh, in terms of the art market. So I wanted to go back a little bit, take, you know, sort of go in the time capsule and just touch on the two exhibitions I did at the New Museum, which um, both have to do very much with the discovery I made 
really two years after arriving in New York, that in fact the art world in New York was a kind of exploding. Until that time, there had really been two centers of power, uh, Uptown or 57th Street, uh, and then during the 80s, uh, 70s and, and into the early 80s, uh, Soho. Soho was a fast growing uh, alternative neighborhood, but within about 10 years, it had begun to take on pretty much all the properties that the uptown galleries were taking on in terms of pricing, uh, the kind of blue chip work that they were, they were showing. So you had this problem, and it's a, it's a problem you encounter in, in many places, uh, which was that there was a whole new generation that they wanted a shot at it. They wanted an audience, uh, and they wanted a venue of their own and a circuit that they could control. And so the East Village uh, was born uh, out of that moment. And I had accidentally moved to the Lower East Side, which was the adjoining neighborhood. Uh, and for all I knew, the neighborhood I was living in was just a, a heroin marketplace. I, I wasn't really, I couldn't distinguish between the very kind of dangerous crimes going on on my doorstep. Uh, the rent was really cheap, uh, in parentheses. Uh, and then this emerging world, but I kept reading about it. I would hear about it and, you know, you, you pick up the Village Voice or the East Village Eye and you'd suddenly you know, learn that graffiti, you know, graffiti from trains was actually making inroads to the galleries. So by the mid 90s, by the end of the 90s, this had all come and gone. Um, I had kind of launched a career as a curator in Europe, and then in 95 come back to New York to, be, to have my first full-time museum curatorial job, which was at the New Museum, and I was there for 11 years. Right about in the middle of that um, tenure at the New Museum, I realized that some of the artists from the old neighborhood <laughs> had become more important, and, and their work had been more impactful than the, than the first time around. And furthermore, that one of those artists was already dead from AIDS and another one was very, very sick. Uh, and, and so I, I, I kind of f decided I wanted to focus, like kind of come back to home, come back to my own backyard and look at these two artists. I've kept this slide up long enough. Uh, this is uh, Martin Wong. Uh, many of you may know his work. Uh, like the other artist I'm gonna show you, he was primarily self-taught. Uh, he was born in San Francisco um, to Chinese, uh, to family from Hong Kong, uh, became a relatively successful Chinese curio dealer, uh, and then moved to the East Village and literally taught himself to paint, closed himself up in a room and painted every day for three or four years, uh, and then started to show his paintings in vegetarian restaurants in the neighborhood. And one day he was discovered by Gracie Mansion. Uh, he was very well known for painting prison life. Uh, he lived on the Lower East Side, we developed a close relationship with Miguel Pinheiro, the, the playwright, and often uh, took stories that Pinheiro would share with him about life in, behind bars and transform them into paintings. Even though he hadn't been there, he had a very vivid idea of what this would look like. So I, I presented a retrospective of Martin's work in 1999, um, and then by early 2000, he, he was gone. Uh, just at that time, I, I began working on a much more complicated project, which was a retrospective of David Wanarovich, uh, who had already uh, been gone for some time. He died in 92. Uh, but Wanarovich was a pivotal figure uh, for the East Village. Uh, he also was self-taught. He was a, a runaway uh, who, you know, lived on the streets of New York, literally. Uh, and this photo is taken of him when he was uh, working on wharves, piers, sorry, off the, uh, on the Hudson River uh, on the west side uh, highway. And he was involved in a world that was very um, scary at that time because these were very dangerous places uh, to hang out, uh, but they were also really big and really open and they had this destructive kind of feeling to them. And so he began his art career painting murals on the outside of these walls and then doing little performances uh, in which he appeared in them. Uh, within a short period of time, by the early, by 83 or 84, he'd begun to paint. Peter Hujar, the photographer, kind of took him under his wing. Uh, this is actually a partially a portrait of uh, Peter Hujar. Uh, and for a while he was using stencils uh, because they were easy, they were a shortcut uh, that he could use to just kind of get the imagery uh, going. But he later learned a, a, a passable uh, painterly technique, uh, which he you know, still would deploy in unexpected ways. For example, with found supermarket posters in which he could kind of work through his own ideas about violence and criminality and then kind of male um, sexuality, masculinity in, 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 in American society. Uh, but 
Increasingly, he turned his attention to photography. He learned he had AIDS uh, in 88 and more or less stopped painting. He would, he would pick, it, pick up the brush again towards the end of his life, but he realized he, painting was much too slow. Uh, so he focused for a long time on photography and probably made his biggest artistic impact, making works like these, which were done by breaking into the Museum of Natural History uh, on the west side uh, with a friend who worked there uh, and literally kind of uh, manipulating the buffalo American Buffalo display, so they became like lemmings, um, tossing them. So this is way before Photoshop uh, ever existed. Uh, and then, you know, there were increasingly works like this, which he made at the, towards the very end of his life, where his whole kind of struggle as a gay man to understand the politics of, of being gay at that time, uh, and then the kind of political uh, quagmire that happened during AIDS uh, and kind of being in a Catholic background and, and having a running war with the Archbishop uh, of New York City really helped to complicate his life at a time when he was really struggling uh, to stay alive. So I, focus, I wanted to just focus on Wanarovich and Wong because um, what happened to me after uh, the attacks of September 11th, 2001 uh, was that I, uh, I was on my way to Istanbul. And I had to turn back because everyone did. And I uh, um, had this very interesting double response because I was living in downtown Manhattan. It happened to us and every, lots of people around me and people were very, very deeply affected, of course. Uh, and the city was traumatized for a really long time. But one of the things that I became aware of was that um, there was a corner that was being turned in the way that Americans talked about um, Islam. And the experience that I had had um, up until that point in my career, um, admittedly only with Turkey and Egypt a little bit, um, was quite different from the pot that was sort of being stirred and the sort of fear and paranoia that was, that was being encouraged and, and um, inflamed uh, in American society. So about two months, I really wanted to do something at that time that could articulate my own feelings about where the United States, or where as an American, because there was also, I think, a very shared feeling of helplessness at that time, how as an American I could contribute positively um, to what was happening. So two months after the attacks, my phone rings, and it's the Istanbul Biennial, the same one I'd been on my way to, which I never did see, um, saying, how would you like to be the first American to organize the Istanbul Biennial? And I wept and then <laughs> said, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm completely committed um, to doing this. Within a little while, and I guess you have to understand with this within the political context of the time, within a little while it was clear to me that I was going to be addressing to the extent that I could the political reality, which was that the United States was about to invade Iraq, which is a neighboring country, um, to Turkey, and that here I was as an American in a country where um, the number of people against that idea was already at 95% and rising um, quickly. So what was I going to do? I presented an exhibition called Poetic Justice. And I asked all of the artists involved to use whatever means they could to bring th their feelings or their response to the contemporary reality to the fore, to a viewer. Um, in this case, you have Anne Hamilton, uh, who's created a kind of a moving labyrinth of curtains attached to motorized uh, rods that form rooms, you know, rooms made of cloth, uh, almost like they were part of a caravan uh, moving across the, the Silk Road. And they would change configuration about every 10 minutes. So you could have a room and suddenly have a feeling of privacy, and then the new mechanism would start and they'd rearrange themselves. And, you were public again, and, and somebody else would, would have had the private space. So these various rooms were little kind of like the changing um, scenario for prayer. Um, Doho Su also took a very interesting uh, method to uh, make a work about the space that we were involved. Uh, the main venue is called the Entrepot. It's now Istanbul Modern, if any of you have been there recently. Uh, and it, suggest that there should be a third floor. It's almost as if the people who originally <laughs> engineered the space um, planned to have a third floor and then stopped. So he used his kind of signature nylon uh, phantom architecture uh, to insert the stairwell and the new level um, that should be there or seems to want to be there, um, just floating underneath the skylight above. Um, so we have a lot of um, places in which I think that 
uh, kind of mutated languages into, or mediums start to appear in, in a project like this. I mean, Anne Hamilton is not a painter, but she's, I don't know, the sculpture had a particularly textual quality to it. Um, the Doho Su seemed very pictorial to me. Um, we invited Song Dong, um, who at that time was doing kind of performances uh, in mirrors, where he would sort of show you a reflection uh, in a mirror, which was kind of traditional uh, Beijing, old Beijing, and then he'd give it a nice whack with a hammer, and you'd see that what behind it, what was really going on, was uh, modern reconstruction and developments um, consuming, if not obliterating, what you had just been looking at um, in the mirror. So Istanbul's famously half in Asia and half in Europe, uh, so Songdong couldn't wait uh, to get <laughs> halfway between those two and do the same kind of smashing, uh, a transforming view where you're looking at Asia and then suddenly you're looking at Europe, or you're looking at Europe and suddenly you're looking at Asia, which is very relevant right now because Turkey is always on the brink, it seems, of joining the European Union, um, which seems to just get perpetually delayed. One of the most uh, evocative places to do to show contemporary art in um, in in Istanbul is the cistern uh, underneath the city. It's a Roman cistern from the fourth century, and the water is constantly running underneath, it's, it's spectacular. And a number of artists really kind of went to town and I think even established a new watermark for their own uh, production when, when in their interactions with the space. Uh, Nalini Malani uh, developed a kind of long landscape uh, projection spread out over about 100 feet of walls using a very primitive uh, transparent cylinders on which she painted. Uh, imagery that actually mixed traditional Buddhist and Islamic uh, calligraphy and, and symbolism uh, to kind of show how her own country, uh, India, really uh, was carved very violently out of a reality in, in which the boundaries between Hindu and Islam were very porous and then suddenly became uh, murderously uh, clear. Uh, and she was born in in what is now Pakistan and had to move to Delhi. So she, it's a little bit of this always reflects her own history. A uh, very different interpretation came from Jennifer Steinkamp, who um, made a very early visit. She's from Los Angeles. And, and uh, when she heard about the cistern, she said, is that the one with the upside down Medusa head? And I said, yeah, that's the place. And she said, has anyone claimed the Medusa head yet? And I said, well, no, actually, Jennifer. And can, but can we wait till we get there first? Um, and we got there, and she said, I know exactly what I'm doing. And that was it. And then about six months later, she came back with these Medusa-type snaky movements incorporated through animated animation software into these Disney-like trees. So I can't show I wish I could show you the moving image. I probably could have figured that out, but none of these uh, trees are still, and nor do they move like trees. They move in this very disturbing, animal-like, snaky uh, quality that is obviously meant to be a direct uh, reference to this work. Um, again, even in the most sculptural and public projects, I think that there was something about the pictorial that lingered. Um, this is an aerial view of Doris Salcedo's uh, project for Istanbul. She was. Uh, based in Colombia, she's always intrigued and in making her work, constructing her work around a sort of a threshold between war and peace, uh, when a country sort of, when its citizens don't quite know where they are. Uh, and in this case, she um, was kind of following how t Turkey became anti-Greek and anti-Jew in a very particular moment in the 20s, uh, where they used tax laws to basically get everybody out of the country. But it was t an attempt to do it without um, arms being involved. She gathered up thousands of wooden, used wooden chairs all over the country and then stacked them, wedged them using an armature between these two buildings in the old hardware uh, quarter of town, which has very modest um, uh, structures all around it. But it had a very precise order to it, the way that each chair was fitted into the armature and fitted against itself was flush. It was absolutely like razor crisp uh, in terms of all of its lines. So, of course, when you're standing on the street, your image is, is, is one of order. You say, well, this obviously took a very elaborate system in which to make this. And when you step back and then go further and further back, the chaos that's erupting uh, on the top becomes that much clearer to you. So segue a little bit from Istanbul to Taipei. I was invited by the Taipei Biennial to 
be the first American to do that uh, biennial in 2006. I was working on a project in Beijing at the same time. So I got to experience firsthand, <coughs> pardon me, this sort of surreal quality of passing between Taiwan and mainland China and then back to Taiwan, which you can never do directly. You always have to go through a, a second place um, to make that happen. Uh, but I, I wanted to do it because I thought that the whole question of, of, of tai, Taiwan's identity uh, in the world was a question mark, and, and Taipei itself had already established this biennial as probably the most influential um, and certainly the earliest uh, significant international biennial in Asia. Uh, so I called the exhibition Dirty Yoga. Uh, I, my rationale for doing so was that I was really very interested in uh, notions of intellectual copyright and that yoga, which is one of the primary vehicles by which the West sort of co-ops Eastern spirituality, um, also can't be copyrighted in any way. So if you want to start a class of, you know, bachelor yoga or chocolate yoga, or so, there's no one who can stop you. It's, it's open, it's, it's, it's free and accessible. And I thought, yeah, dirty yoga. Uh, that's really, um, that's what people want. You know, that, so uh, the artists were asked to explore this idea of purity and, and impurity, maybe as, as the dialectic. And um, um, uh, one of the first artists to, to uh, respond to this uh, was um, Regina Silverda uh, from Rio de Janeiro, who had been working on this project called Saga, in which she tried to use footprints to illustrate movements or passages of people across large areas uh, over time. And it's kind of like a transformation uh, from one place, from one people in one place to a people in another place. This kind of blurring of distinctions was something that tried to take physical shape um, in the way that projects uh, were both inside and outside of the museum. You can see the Caterina Grossa uh, installation towards the top of the photo, which looks a little bit like it's painted on, but that's because it passes from the bench uh, across the floor, uh, through the window, and then out onto the patio beyond. Uh, I think uh, the next image, down in the lower corner, you have um, uh, um, Damian Ortega's uh, portable obelisk, uh, which is sort of Washington's monument on wheels, and you can just pull it around uh, from place to place if you want. That's sort of a close-up of the Grossa. Uh, Neri Ward constructed a sort of three-story black snowman made of tar. Uh, that was sort of embedded with um, material objects, cassettes, watches, iPhones, things that people want, and they're all just kind of in there. And then you sort of see this old uh, newsreel of, of presentation um, footage that comes just before a, a movie is played as a kind of like an exportation of all of these dreams that then just become a, a, well, literally a tar baby, something you get stuck to trying to pull material wealth out of it. It's another view of the, there was a real, this was before the era of selfies, but there are a lot of people who were contorting themselves to get in a photo um, uh, with that. I'm gonna try to speed this up, sorry, just a little bit. Um, but there were, um, there were definitely art, artists in the exhibition who were working with uh, both traditional um, modes of representation mixed with a more digital um, idea. Um, Vivan Sundaram uh, is a photographer who actually incorporates old photographs from his family uh, into these like curious mirrored montages where great aunts are meeting her mother or this grandmother's there in two different eras of her life and people keep slipping in and out of memory and, and reality. Um, and then Yeon Du Young, who's a Korean photographer who creates these sort of elaborate tableaus that look like they're trying to fool you into accepting a photographic illusion, but always leaving the edge of the canvas or the photo backdrop or making sure that whatever it is that exposes it as a studio setup is very clearly evident in the photo. So you're, you're kind of, you wanna believe it, but you can't at, at the same time. Uh, Chow Fei made an interesting project for the uh, biennial in which she, uh, her father was a traditional sculptor who depicted Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, who's a sort of neutral figure on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. So she decided to uh, take her father's portrait busts of Sun Yat-sen and bring them over uh, to Taipei and display them there with the idea being that there's absolutely no difference between <laughs> this man depicted on one side of the street um, and on the other. And she actually um, incorporated a lot of conversations in the streets with people about the Taiwan independence uh, versus 
uh, unification question, which is there's only one political question in Taiwan and, and that's it. Um, which of course people in Taiwan themselves are sick to death of arguing about in public. And in China it's a little bit more um, controlled uh, how, how things like this are discussed. Anyway, um, shortly after that I got involved with the Orange County Museum of Art where I'm working right now. The director sort of had breakfast with me in New York and said like, there's gotta be an exhibition that you've been dying to do. Um, your entire career and you haven't done up until now. And I said, of course there is, it's Peter Saul. And he said, I hereby commission you <laughs> to organize a Peter Saul uh, retrospective. So I, you know, I'm still at the new museum, but meanwhile I'm kind of beginning a, another project, the project in New Orleans, but I also take on this project at the same time because I really felt like Peter Saul is an artist of immense historical importance who's beginning to get his due. But you know, he's currently in his mid 70s um, and he has spent most of his life being um, not ignored so much as just shoved violently to the side and aggressively um, um, uh, biased against or acted against. Uh, it's easy to see why. Uh, 1964, the year when pop art means you know, soup cans, uh, he decides to crucify Donald Duck because isn't that what pop art really is supposed to be? Uh, you know, taking uh, things like the, the crucifixion, the most powerful image in, in uh, Christian civilization, in Christian uh, culture, um, and putting America's most um, plastic icon um, onto that crucifixion. So he didn't want pop art, or he didn't want painting in any way to seem like it was behaved or, or properly behaving. So he's the ultimately politically incorrect artist. Uh, his paintings are uh, casually offensive uh, to just about anyone. Uh, Charlie Hebdo might be a really good example. Uh, Saul's whole idea about being an artist came when his mother took him to an exhibition in San Francisco when he was about nine years old. Uh, and it was a Picasso uh, exhibition. And people were protesting uh, Picasso at that time uh, because he, not just because he was a modern artist or a cubist, God help us, but apparently he had suspected communist sympathies. So this was a time when people were out there basically saying, down with Picasso. And Peter Saul was young and impressionable and he thought, wow, paintings can get people really upset. Uh, that's why you should be a painter is to get people as upset as you possibly can. So this is when Governor Ronald Reagan um, was enjoying his uh, six year, eight year term uh, in California. Um, you can see Martin Luther King has already been assassinated. Um, you know, the crack epidemic is still on the horizon, but illegal drugs are being pumped right into that California ghetto economy um, to make sure that the underclass stays um, beaten down. Uh, so, you know, this was not going to get him any friends, uh, nor did it get him any collectors, uh, or much at the time. Uh, my life was probably transformed because the year I moved to New York, he showed this painting uh, at his gallery, Alan Frumkin. Um, and Peter Saul had never been really a resident of New York. Uh, he was just going by these sensational headlines he was seeing about people shooting people up uh, in the New York subway system. So he was like, yeah, I, I can do that. This is a mural. This is about 22 feet long. Uh, and there are about 60 people dying simultaneously um, in this image. Bystanders, policemen, um, possible crooks. Um, you don't know. But this just orgy of comic violence, um, which seems sort of sadistic, uh, is in fact, I think, um, a, a product of a, kind of a recent manifestation of a deep tradition of, of political satire in art, which gets you upset um, just because it addresses things in a satirical mode that are meant to be taken seriously. Um, I had no idea in 2008 when I was standing in front of the Orange County arts patrons and explaining them why a painting of George W. Bush in Abu Ghraib prison um, was something that they should take seriously as high art. Uh, I had to do this with a straight, fa straight face, folks, and they had to listen to it with a straight face um, as well, and somehow we all got through it. But meanwhile, here's Peter Saul, who's sort of constructed a, a more than half a century career out of 
making us look, I didn't show you the execution of Ethel Rosenberg, but it almost made the final cut, a and showing you that yes, in fact, an artist's job is actually to infuriate um, the people around them, at least this comfortable status quo that art might otherwise assume. So I'm gonna switch gears here, talk a little bit about Prospect New Orleans and, and at least how that all happened. Um, as I think many of you know, um, in August of 2005, at the end of the month, um, Katrina came and went, the levee system collapsed, uh, the city flooded very, very quickly, 80% was inundated, uh, and I, as a longtime lover of New Orleans, and kind of a booster of New Orleans art, but particularly music, uh, I was really devastated. I didn't know what to do. You know, many people who were on the road then um, just felt completely cut off. So you're calling New Orleanians in Texas and Colorado and Boston or wherever it was they were winding up and trying to get news and trying to find out what was happening. Um, Fred Tomaselli, who would later be a, a participating artist in Prospect, kind of memorializes that turning point because this New York Times series, uh, which the Orange County Museum is about to show um, in a couple of weeks, uh, began with the headline with the headline that you're seeing. When he woke up in the morning and saw New Orleans flooded like this and the image taking up like what seven eighths of the above the page, uh, he realized that this was an historic moment that he felt compelled to respond to but didn't know how. Uh, later on, he would figure out that what he really wanted to do was make a, a scan of it, a perfect photographic scan, and start painting um, onto the image and adding and adding and adding. Um, people, friends of mine in New Orleans, heard my plea to get involved somehow, to be engaged in the you know, sort of reconstruction, cultural rebuilding of the city. Um, I was phasing out of the new museum at that time. I realized I didn't want to continue. Uh, and there seemed to be some way that I could apply my energies um, to the city. I went down in January 2006. It was my first post-Katrina visit. There was a big town hall meeting, uh, and everybody talked about what's to be done and what's to be done. And just anecdotally, there was a historian sitting next to me who said, you don't have to worry because tourists are going to come back to New Orleans eventually, and tourists are the people that buy art, and you'll all be OK. And you know, I was looking out, and I recognized dozens of people in the audience and realized that most of them were visual artists and that what they had just heard was deeply offensive to them. And that it was my job as a co-panelist to correct him, which I did. I was like, Doug, with all due respect, tourists don't buy art. Tourists buy tchotchkes and gigaws. Collectors buy art. So if we're talking about a recovery that's actually gonna help the art world in New Orleans, we have to bring collectors to New Orleans and all who accompany those collectors. Whatever we do, we have to bring them if we want the artist to feel the positive impact. And there was a pause and I said, and there's only two models for doing that, an art fair, which would be a terrible idea for this city, or a biennial, which I don't know, what do you think? And then it just floated and then by, by dinner time I realized that I couldn't stop talking about it. And by breakfast, oh, and somebody gave me a chapbook. And the chapbook consisted of photographs that somebody had taken um, of decorated refrigerators around New Orleans because you had to remove, you know, your refrigerator might have been untended for like six weeks in a hundred something degree weather. And you would and should not under any circumstance permit yourself to open the refrigerator door. It was like a lethal biochemical weapon in there. So your instructions were take your duct tape, kill the curiosity, take the duct tape, wrap your refrigerator up, and pull it out onto the street. So, of course, people have got these refrigerators, so what do you do? You decorate them. And then what happens? Well, that guy's decoration is pretty cool. Well, I'm gonna go, go, go home and get some sequins and some paint and some ribbon, and I'm gonna make my refrigerator prettier than that next refrigerator. And of course, the black humor that you see here, you've done a great job, Brownie. If you don't recognize that quote, that's a misquote, a paraphrase of, President Bush saying, you've done a heck of a job, Brownie, to Michael Brown, who was then the head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency that was royally screwing up the job of trying to save New Orleans. So I thought, look, flipping through that book, <coughs> I thought, you know what? Here's a city that's apparently been ripped asunder and people are making jokes. I mean, people are cracking wise about it. And I thought, you know what? Maybe there's a way of doing this. So I don't want to talk about anything about the structure of New Orleans, which is about Prospect, which is very complicated. I had to start a 501c3 while working part-time at the Contemporary Arts Center. 
Um, but I realized that the program that I had to do at the Contemporary Arts Center, which was broke and had no staff, um, had to create a context for Prospect, which was coming down the pike in 2008. So the first project I did was called Something From Nothing, uh, in which I invited artists from outside to come to New Orleans, and we would pay for their travel, we would pay for their lodging, we would pay for their food, but they had zero budget for materials and production. So everything that happened had to be begged, borrowed, or given uh, to the, the artist. And all these artists were strangers. So the idea of being involved meant you had to get into the community, make friends, collaborate, and then hopefully those friends would collaborate with you. This is Sean Duffy from uh, LA who made a uh, sort of a topograph topographic garden sculpture uh, using discarded uh, office equipment, which was pretty ubiquitous at that time. Uh, Echo Negroho, who's from uh, an Indonesian artist who does a lot of work in comics, uh, did a kind of a wraparound mural in the staircase of the CAC. Um, and I wanted to do a number of exhibitions focusing on what I believe to be the unique visual art heritage of New Orleans, in, among them curating a large exhibition of Luis Cruz Azaceta, who's a Cuban artist who's been living there uh, since the early 90s and is maybe the most universally known artist uh, in New Orleans. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time working with an artist who I already worked with several times there named Douglas Bourgeois, uh, who is a uh, uh, almost folk-like painter. He creates very intricate uh, paintings of, let's call them vernacular scenes. Uh, this is Irma Thomas uh, standing <laughs> next to a swamp um, and a cypress tree in the Spanish, it's all there. Um, and, it's, and the song is actually Let It Rain. Um, Generic Art Solutions, one of the formative uh, groups behind uh, Good Children, which is one of the St. Claude Galleries uh, artists. They kind of clearly popped out as artists on the local scene that were making important work. So Prospect was developed as a large-scale, citywide, uh, international, biennial, later triennial uh, exhibition. We did a lot of um, uh, kind of trying to interface very consciously with the history of New Orleans uh, tourism. This is a reference to the uh, uh, 1884 Cotton Centennial Exhibition, which was really the first full-blown tourist attraction that brought people internationally to New Orleans. Uh, it also featured an aerial map of the city. At that time, it was taken by balloon. Uh, in this case, we've got hundreds and hundreds of uh, digital photos that are all tiled uh, together and looking kind of unfinished, because that's how the city felt. And then I, we've ringed it with images of the venues, which all look like penny postcard images from the 20s or 30s that have all been hand-colored. So everything had this weirdly um, nostalgic uh, sort of feeling to it in terms of presenting the mode. The artists were all invited to be as direct and explicit as they wanted to be. Uh, the show was not referenced as a political gesture, but obviously there was a response to be made that was measured differently in different people's experiences. Leandro Ehrlich, um, came from Argentina, uh, took a look around and said, you know, I want, I want to make part of a house that's no longer here, uh, but it's gonna be the house that you can't get out of, or, or you can get out of by the time help arrives, uh, it's too late, because uh, the house is gone. Uh, Mark Bradford very famously uh, built a three-story arc um, using construction plywood um, taken from South Central LA and transported to New Orleans with all the handbills still attached. Uh, so when the arc was um, you know, fully constructed, you could still read all these ads for upcoming concerts and sales and products being released in Los Angeles uh, the previous summer. Uh, Neri Ward uh, transformed a, a Baptist church into a very interesting two-part uh, construction. Uh, this was the interior where he'd kind of crushed all of this gym equipment and put it inside a uh, diamond that was then mirrored or surrounded by mirrored lit surfaces. Uh, it's called Diamond Gym. Uh, and on the outside, what you had was a bulletin board uh, for the neighborhood, something that no one actually had uh, provided uh, for that particular neighborhood. So I was w walking around the neighborhood and talking to all the neighbors in preparation. He said, you know, is there something that you don't have that you guys need? And several people said, I'd just love to go somewhere where I could find out, you know, who's back and is there any events and is there a fundraiser and who's got a washing machine and you know who's mowing lawns on and on so he said okay i'll make a two part you know this otherworldly um, amazingly aspirational sculpture and then a kind of a lowly everyday highly functional uh, uh, 
bulletin board. Paul Velinsky uh, from New York took a FEMA trailer, uh, gutted it, and then set up uh, wind and solar panels in order to customize the interior. Uh, and he moved this all over the city because there were still brownouts at that time. And having someone who had their own power source could be very useful. This was designed as an artist response system. So artists in hearing of a catastrophe somewhere could go off the grid and get to that place quickly and do their artwork uh, without having to depend on running electricity uh, somewhere. I don't you know, whether there was a need or is a need for the emergency response system for artists is kind of an open question surrounding it. Um, but these issues of uh, using a FEMA trailer was, I think, the most pointed aspect of it. Uh, Wageshi Mutu uh, was also, most of these projects were on the Lower Ninth Ward or somewhere located near there. Uh, she came to town, got really good friends with um, a woman whose house had been not just blown away, but also uh, she'd been ripped off by contractors. They poured her a really flimsy foundation and then absconded with all of her money. Uh, so um, essentially the house was built first as a kind of a pretend house that was made of just sticks and Christmas lights and it would glow at night. You can sort of see a, a version of that. Uh, the artist then made two engravings uh, of the project, two etchings that she um, presented to her dealers to sell at art fairs and they would all go into the fund. Uh, for the house. And then after about a year and a half, sure enough, the money had come in. She hired a women's carpenter cooperative, construction cooperative um, in the city uh, to build the house much better than it originally was uh, without you know, the, the original occupant having to do anything. A number of interesting painting options occurred in this project. Uh, one was McCallum and Terry, uh, who were a collaborative team, uh, who wanted to work with the material that was found after the uh, 1956 Montgomery bus boycott, which was a very important event uh, in the history of the South. Uh, these mugshots had only recently come to light. Uh, and they basically sent the mugshots to China, uh, to a village where they could have all of these image represented in the mode of, I'm sorry for the cliche, but the venerated ancestor. So someone who is beloved and will be remembered fondly for many, many generations. And that requires you know, a certain depiction of the clothing and the setting. And they created um, 117 of these double images where close up you see the black and white image of the mugshot and underneath you see, sorry, I don't have any close ups here. Uh, underneath you see the venerated ancestor. It's almost as if the criminal uh, and the beloved um, ancestor are co-occupying the same visual space. Um, Gajin Fujita uh, came to town for a weekend when the Saints won and got to watch what happens in New Orleans when the Saints win. Uh, so his whole energy came to making this uh, kind of gold-leafed uh, homage uh, to the Saints, but it's kind of deconstructing this idea where he's become sort of a 23rd century troubadour kabuki uh, figure um, in which the relationship to the NFL team is only the present uh, through the calligraphy um, or the fleur-de-lis logos. And of course, he gifted that um, to the city uh, when it was all finished, because where else would a painting like this um, make sense? Although it's actually traveled many times um, since then. Um, Navin Rawanchaikul from Bangkok uh, did a fantastic project. He, he um, you may know he hates his name. Uh, he doesn't know why his parents gave him that name. It's an Indian name, it's not a proper Thai name. So no one, none of his friends when he was growing up were named Navin. And so the Navin Project is about finding other people named Navin who hate their names and, 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 and making tributes to them. Um, and he went through the obituaries in New Orleans after Katrina and then came to us and said, I found it, I found it, um, <laughs> Navin Kimball. Uh, Navin Kimball died uh, after Katrina. And I thought, why does that name sound weirdly familiar? And it turned out he was talking about Narvin Kimball, uh, who is the banjo player for the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. But he found an obituary that left out the R because you know, not all copy editors are gonna get the difference between Navin and Narvin. So we thought, well, you know what? It's close enough, let's see what the family thinks. So Narvin Kimball had died um, in Savannah about six months after uh, Katrina and never, Augusta, sorry, uh, and never had a jazz funeral. 
So that was going to be the point of Narvin's collaboration uh, with him, essentially the family, Preservation Hall Jazz Band, New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, everybody got behind this project of giving Narvin Kimball, because for one day it became the Narvin party instead of the Navin party, um, his long overdue jazz funeral. So it was done very Southeast Asian style where you had the paintings being carried um, by the mourners or the celebrants um, as they follow his former colleagues, um, in this case down Rampart Street on the opening day of, of, of Prospect One, and then it ended up actually at Preservation Hall. And most of the paintings are now in collections uh, in New Orleans, so the presence uh, really stayed. Um, Adam Svianovich did one of the most extraordinary transformations of a house uh, in the Lower Ninth Ward, a second story pharmacy that was in the process of being turned into a neighborhood dance studio. Um, but it had gotten pretty waterlogged. Um, fortunately, the second story was in pretty great shape. Uh, so he spent a visit basically um, sketching and photographing the, the bayou uh, and then looking at the history of decorative arts in New Orleans and decided to cover two rooms of this second story with hand-painted wallpaper uh, that depicted the bayou. So it's as if this encroaching natural force, you know, where the house used to be, um, and which the house will eventually be again, is somehow the visual reality that you encounter um, when you get up there. And you don't even see necessarily what it is or recognize it um, as, you know, both this beautiful kind of almost orgasmic visual image um, that just surrounds you from all sides, as well as something very deadly and portentous for the, for the future. Um, Trenton Doyle Hancock, who is probably the kind of nationally renowned painter most recognized in New Orleans, he's had many, many exhibitions uh, in New Orleans, uh, was very enthusiastic and sent us about a half a dozen um, new paintings uh, that were really quite spectacular, and I think accounted in a, in a way for some of the degree of the impact um, of the exhibition locally, because he was already a, a very well-known name, and of course Houston was the city that was the most sort of responsive uh, to New Orleans residents uh, after Katrina, and so this idea that he was coming back um, was going to be celebrated. Fred Tomaselli, interestingly enough, had made a his exhibition in New York in 2007 about Katrina, but he didn't tell anybody. Uh, so works like these, um, uh, really didn't resonate. I mean, you, you read the press for the exhibition and nobody mentions Katrina, even though it was less than two years uh, previous. And then when I called him for the exhibition, he, he immediately assumed that I knew the story behind these paintings and that that was why um, I was calling him. And of course, when an artist assumes that you know something that you don't know, you have to immediately pretend that you knew it all along. Uh, so don't tell him uh, when you see him. But uh, this to me was a pretty interesting example of kind of responding to a New Orleanian's feeling of being forgotten in the aftermath of Katrina, not knowing that a, such a nationally renowned artist was putting so much effort into trying to crystallize their feelings about Katrina and then bringing all of this work, some of which had been um, collected abroad, uh, to New Orleans for the first time so that people could experience. Uh, the most powerful contribution on this end was from Julie Moretu, who had sort of been a, a recluse from the art world for about a year and a half at this point, and I called her thinking I would get a painting or two uh, for the exhibition, and she said, oh, fantastic, I've just finished a whole series of five huge paintings, <laughs> and no one's seen them yet. Would that be okay for your biennial, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I had already dropped the phone on the floor by that time, but these were a turning point in her work because it was kind of moving from the architectural uh, paradigm that she'd been operating from at that point into a much more explicitly landscape um, reference, and now of course she's deeply off into Sai Twombly land, so this seems almost like a, a stepping stone from one period to the other. But they were, it, when you show five giant Julie Moretu paintings um, in your museum, you get a lot of people showing up <laughs> in backpacks and, and sitting around for hours and hours. It was really, um, she was from Detroit, by the way. She was living um, in Detroit at that time. So it was really interesting how that resonated locally. Um, I had felt very strongly that, and some people had helped to explain to me locally that visual art or contemporary art is a mixed message kind of a phrase in New Orleans because so many people who make what we should consider contemporary art aren't really permitted to describe themselves as contemporary artists, so they always get left out of that conversation. 
Um, I was always very interested in Mardi Gras Indian uh, tradition, and, and my friend Bill Fagley, who is a curator at the New Orleans Museum of Art, uh, had already done a major museum retrospectus of Tutti Montana, who is the kind of father of all the really great Mardi Gras Indian suit makers. Um, if you don't know, the big chief uh, who is in charge of his own uh, suit uh, spends most of the year making the suit, and every all of his uh, uh, the tribe that goes with him uh, will be making suits based on his suit. But his suit is the most important, and it doesn't come out until Mardi Gras morning. Uh, so the big chief's homes are very often places where people early in Mardi Gras morning are camped out already to see what the big chief uh, is going to wear. Victor Harris uh, is the big chief of Fayayai, and he would be the first Mardi Gras uh, Indian chief to have based his decorate his uh, suits on African uh, motifs. He was the first person to not use a mask, but to use a head dress um, entirely. And even though he does reference the kind of Great Plains Indians, uh, Indian style, uh, the fact that showing, for example, as we did seven suits uh, by Victor Harris was a way of giving him a seven year retrospective, um, you know, because it's one work uh, per year, was also a way of kind of contextualizing very advanced Mardi Gras Indian practice in a framework that out-of-town visitors were, would understand. So it was really important to me that Roberta Smith from the New York Times would walk into this room in this gallery and not say, oh, this is something local. She would say, this too is contemporary art and, and kind of address her comments. So just having been able to succeed on that scale uh, made me very happy. Um, Prospect 2, which happened three years later, was a smaller affair, but we had a number of, I think, very important contributions from the artists like Alexis Rockman, uh, who spent about two years making this massive mural of about 35, uh, uh, what's the word, indigenous species and about 50 imported species, kind of all having a battle royale uh, against each other someday when people are no longer around to kind of pollute the scene. Um, Pavel Wojtasek made an amazing 360 degree surround uh, uh, video uh, projection of areas of Louisiana that are essentially more water than land now. And so all of the video was made at horizon level. So as you stepped into it, you, you had this extraordinary feeling of being kind of engulfed and it kept moving around different spots of Louisiana. So you really got the impression what a state that's characteristically several feet or dozens of feet below sea level really is like, what it really uh, feels like. This is the first edition of Prospect where we had international artists being funded by their governments. Uh, Michel Dubrin from, from Quebec uh, came and made this spectacular star out of discarded uh, neighborhood uh, street lamps uh, around the city. And then most memorably, Don Dido, uh, local uh, pioneer in, in digital and, and, and media-based arts, uh, made a massive installation uh, showing uh, kind of a section of, um, of, of uh, Confederacy of Dunces, like kind of one chapter of that book that's kind of about the wet dreams that the main character Ignatius is having, and this is sort of the area where the Empress Fortuna comes to him uh, every night uh, in his dreams. In this case, it's, the, it's Big Frida, uh, the um, bounce, uh, artist who at that time was very much kind of a local character before she became a kind of a cable um, star. Uh, so the goddess Fortuna uh, is represented by um, uh, Big Frida and Katie Red, who's the other star, represented others. So very quickly, I want to talk a little bit just about show you what I've been working on since I came to the Orange County Museum of Art. Um, uh, as Bev mentioned, uh, the California Pacific Biennial was a way of re tooling uh, the California Biennial, which is a statewide survey exhibition. I believe that California and its future are directly tied to the Pacific Rim. And that demographically, economically, culturally in every sense, you can't talk about California anymore without talking about Canada, Mexico, China, Japan, but also Chile, Peru, Australia, Korea, all these cultures are steadily influencing uh, California and more in a more pronounced way than they are the rest of the country. So we decided to start the first international survey because if you curate biennials habitually, sometimes you just see it as the um, right answer to a certain situation. Um, a turning point for me was coming across Hugo Crosswaite from Tijuana, uh, who's been making this series of what he calls uh, Tijuaneras uh, from, for, for several years, in which he kind of looks at 
daily life um, on the street and kind of adds this surrealist uh, dimension to it. He's a master draftsman. He just goes around the city uh, with his little black book, sketching people all day long. Uh, and these, these have no photographic elements to them, in case you're, you're wondering. They're all just completely drawn uh, by hand. And in the end, he made um, a series of uh, giant tarps, like circus tarps, uh, for it that kind of traces the uh, a local provincial theater form that used to exist uh, and be very popular in Mexico uh, before the advent of television. Uh, Bryce Bischoff, uh, who happens to be a Louisiana transplant, uh, based in Los Angeles today, was a, a local artist who I f whose work I found very compelling. He creates these uh, kind of long exposure photographs in which he then steps in and manipulates uh, the color, the framing, uh, the, the light in, in very particular ways uh, to make these sort of dramatic and illusionistic uh, works. Uh, Kim Baum, who's an artist from Korea who I really have loved for many years. Uh, I saw a project that he had done in Gwangju the year before and thought I really had to bring it to California. Uh, in this case, he's hired an actor uh, to portray uh, a painting teacher, someone who comes on TV and gives you an art lesson. Uh, in this case, he's trying to show you how to make an expressionist painting. Uh, so if you've never seen the video, it's quite wonderful. Every time he leans in with his paintbrush, he screams. <laughs> and he makes sure that his scream is trapped by the paint molecules uh, inside it. So when you see this painting, you know that it reflects the agony in the soul of the artist uh, who made it. And uh, we, we, we made sure that the painting was, also, was separated from the video so that people would have a little surprise uh, afterwards. Another interesting riff on painting in the exhibition was Arya Rastramransuk, who's also a Thai artist, uh, done a lot of performance-based work. Um, she's become very popular in the West, uh, and so she decided that if she's entering the Western art canon, what she really ought to do is um, play with that back home. So she took a bunch of large size reproductions of Western art masterpieces uh, to Chiang Mai, uh, where she lives, and she asked villagers to critique them. So here you have, here you have rice farmers uh, who are looking at Millet's The Gleaners um, and critiquing the, well, they're not critiquing the brushwork, they're actually critiquing the agricultural methodology of the, peop of the peasants, because they're peasants too, um, depicted in the painting. So as she's kind of entering, as the artist enters this Western canon, she's actually trying to give back by showing how the Western canon won't belong to the West uh, for very much longer. Um, this is actually work we, we inquired for the collection of Dejeuner sur l'herbe, um, shown to villagers sitting having lunch um, on the grass. John Bankston, a San Francisco-based artist who kind of creates cartoon representations of an idealized world where uh, men, males of African descent, are brilliant. Uh, they're scientists, they're visionaries, they're wizards, uh, they're peacemakers, great philosophers, and very snappy dressers. Uh, in other words, an image that we don't have in society. Uh, so he helps to create that um, and invent it and kind of like put it into the mainstream of visual culture. Um, I showed you Eko Negroho's work before, the work uh, that came from Indonesia. Uh, these are a series of posters that he made. I'm not going to kind of bother with the translation, but they were all put on uh, wallpapers showing what political advertising looks like in Indonesia uh, today, which is you can basically say, I heart Democratic Party, or I heart Tea Party, whatever the equivalent would be. You cannot say anything bad against anyone else, and you can't be critical in any way. So the height of political opposition in Indonesia right now is I heart my party. Uh, so these kind of um, clashing images were depicted over that. Uh, Fernando Bryce uh, from Peru made an elaborate 107 drawing uh, installation showing the history of German colonization of the South Pacific. I didn't know uh, that Papua New Guinea um, and uh, Samoa and other um, colonies were actually belonged to Germany uh, for about 30 years, uh, and then they lost it after World War I. But Germany was late into the Pacific colonization game, so they only got little bits of territory. And yet this history, especially for a Peruvian who had no idea and was living in Berlin and stumbled on an archive of German colonization of the South Pacific and just couldn't believe what he had seen. It turns out most Germans couldn't believe what they saw either because this is not really an important part of contemporary German history. Uh, moving along, Liz Magor of Vancouver, who's been a very important artist in 
uh, British Columbia for many years, makes these very strange portraits, composite portraits of people using found clothing from Goodwill stores that she keeps adding to and adding to and they, until they become impossibly overloaded um, with decorative material. Uh, Sebastian Priest, a uh, wonderful artist from Chile, who uh, kind of came to the museum hoping to do an archaeological dig until we told him that in Orange County you can dig all you want, you're not going to find anything of any trace of any prior civilization, uh, at which point he said, well, what if this was the pri prior civilization? What would be next? And in unison we answered, a parking garage, of course. Um, after us will be a parking garage. So he began to transform the architecture of the museum subtly um, to show the, the parking garage that will someday uh, come and replace this space uh, for art uh, that we have. Uh, Michael Lin, uh, who's based in Shanghai, but uh, grew up in Orange County, made his first trip home, uh, where he uh, basically made a giant mural using dozens of volunteers, um, in which he showed kind of import China ware. But of course, this is the European version of import China, where everything that's depicted has been understood third hand. There, no one who was involved in making this kind of fake um, chinoise ever had been to China or knew anything directly about the, the examples they were working from. So the distortions of Asian culture are so dramatic that Michael Lin thought, well, if this is kind of a throwaway motif, um, then I'm gonna make sure that after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of labor go into making this mural from top to bottom, at the end of the exhibition, we must paint it all over. Uh, so it was this very dramatic painting that was exquisitely executed and people just every day couldn't believe that we were at the end of the exhibition, the whole thing was going to go and there would be nothing uh, to remain. Um, I've done two exhibitions based on the collection, one involving the transformation of landscape into abstraction, Carlos Almaraz, um, Anthony Hernandez, uh, different artists who have kind of bridged this important gap where I noticed that the dialogue between landscape and abstraction was very powerful in California, but nowhere else in the country. So I tried to keep tracking it through examples like Lynn Folks, Ken Price, uh, Mary Weatherford on the left, Brian Falstrom on the right, much more contemporary artists, but continuing to work in this sort of visionary uh, landscape mode. Um, um, I'm gonna breeze through this. Uh, last year I did an exhibition kind of combining a father and a son who both had a tie to New Orleans, Paul Sarkeesian, who's one of the most important kind of photorealist based painters of the early 70s, uh, dropped off the grid, moved to Santa Fe, uh, and raised his son there. His son is now a video artist, and the, the two, father and son, happened to share a particular interest in trompe l'oeil. Um, Sarkeesian was one of the first to articulate this sort of abstract illusionist mode, which artists like Laura Owens today um, are taking to uh, another level. Um, this work was made after he dropped out of the art world, so I had the weird experience of doing a kind of an overview, a 50-year overview of an artist, and half of the work uh, that it was presented in the exhibition, including the paintings that you're, painting you're looking at right here, had never been seen by human eyes other than private visitors to the studio. That's how far he fell uh, from the art world, which is, again, a peculiar position to take. Um, but it was one way of kind of talking about his son's work. Peter Sarkeesian is an early video artist uh, who's been working with a particular sort of illusion uh, for the last 20 years. This is a pillow that just sort of floats in the space, but meanwhile you see the impression of the head of the person sleeping on it all night long. So it's kind of a, a movement based on the indirect impression of a, of, a, of a head that you can't see. And a lot of his work deals with the kind of clash between the analog and the digital world. Um, here he's going through a dictionary in miniature and he's transforming all of the dictionary definitions so that it corresponds better to a world of texting and social media, um, just kind of collapsing these unnecessarily uh, v uh, verbal uh, descriptions into something more concise and, and abbreviated if possible. Um, very well known for his uh, suspended pencil, his levitating pencil, which People will stand in front of for half an hour watching it levitate and go up and down and up and down and never figure out uh, how it's done. And the second collection that exhibition that I have done, which just closed a little while ago, kind of treats the phenomenon of the avant-garde from the early 20th century um, until now. Uh, the earliest painting that we had that was uh, demonstrably avant-garde was Stanton MacDonald Wright, uh, who was an Orphist, uh, who actually created a movement called Synchromism that was a spin-off of Orphism in Paris in the 20s before he moved back to California and kind of became the, 
a missionary of modernist uh, painting. Uh, we really went through a number of examples that I didn't know we had, uh, and I was trying to track instances in which certain painting styles, uh, Nathan Oliveira, for example, in the mid-50s, uh, David Park, uh, in San Francisco, kind of in the late 50s, uh, in which these were transformative moments uh, in the evolution of the medium, despite the fact that technically you couldn't really argue that there was an avant-garde in the United States after World War II. Um, but I thought, well, if you keep putting conditions on it, you can continue to sort of move the argument uh, forward a little bit uh, more closely. This is actually the beginning of the museum's collection. Uh, we were given a number of works uh, in uh, 1975 uh, by a local financing company, including one of the Asselman's uh, only sculptures. This is a, a three foot long uh, sculpture of her eraser when she was in fourth grade. Uh, Frederick Hammersley, uh, who I think is one of the pioneers of a certain um, kind of hard edge abstraction, which on the West Coast, I believe with the influence of John McLaughlin, uh, led to the light and space movement, uh, is someone who I feel um, has been insufficiently explored. Uh, so one of the main projects I've been taking on is really trying to talk about the invention of light and space uh, through the hard edge movement, uh, which is uh, I think gonna be a project that's um, gonna be quite illuminating and it's taking years and years to put together it and it's, all, it's called uh, One With Everything. Uh, this is a Doug Wheeler uh, installation. He was one of the pioneers of the light and space movement. Uh, we were given this uh, installation, which looks like a sculpture, but it takes a long time to build, in 1975, uh, and it was never shown. Uh, we showed it for the very first time uh, starting last December, and it's, it's amazing to be able to kind of stumble across these um, gems from the past. This is my first time working full time with a museum with a collection, with a permanent collection. And I really do feel like a kid in a candy shop. We own Charles Ray's first figurative sculpture, uh, which was when he made a, a department store mannequin uh, roughly into his features and dressed it as himself. Uh, the piece actually uh, had to be completely restored because one day our fire alarm went off uh, and the police came into the gallery and the German shepherd took one look at this sculpture and just lunged <laughs> and tore it to ribbons. Uh, something they're expecting. And the pride of our collection, I'm gonna end here, uh, is a, a piece by Chris Burden, uh, who actually, his first job out of UCI was working as a preparator at the same museum. Uh, and this museum, the Orange County Museum, when it was Newport Harbor Art Museum, presented Chris Burden's first retrospective um, in 1988. Uh, this work was purchased the year before, uh, and it's called A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, you probably, you may have seen it at the new museum a couple of years ago in Chris Burden's retrospective. Uh, it's been painstakingly restored over the last uh, two years so that for the first time ever with the uh, 7,000 individual pieces that go into it, the artist now allows the museum to install the entire thing top to bottom without his direct supervision. So it's basically the story of a big city, which you can si sort of see um, off to the left here. Big city is pretty developed. Um, and then little city uh, has a lovely port. Uh, so of course, big city is going to crush it and take over its port. And what the uh, installation basically captures is a transformative moment in the battle. Uh, the superior arms of big city uh, are about to crush the much smaller army of little city. Um, you, what you can't see is there's a, there's a hill um, in the middle of the two cities and there are castles um, on that hill. Those, of course, are the arms merchants uh, who are the ones who are profiting uh, from the war. And growing up in Southern California, I think Chris Burden understood that behind all of this affluence, behind this suburban uh, facade, there was a roaring economy that was booming uh, because of the military industrial uh, complex. So as a little boy who collected soldiers and tanks, and other things, he kind of reached a moment in his adulthood as an artist where he realized that in fact, he had to take this love that he had and this politics that he became aware of as an adult and somehow find a way to work out uh, this impression. So I think it's one of those powerful works I've ever experienced uh, dealing with war um, and particularly the economics of war and the in inevitability of war. Um, and I also think it kind of helps us articulate that you know the function of a collection, of a museum collection, isn't just to pass the work on to another generation, it's to completely recontextualize work that may have not been understood properly whenever it was made and making it completely new uh, to an audience today. So thank you all very much for being a great, great audience here.